Hello everyone, welcome back to the Greenwood and Moulin Show here on Newcastle Fans TV. Today Sam and I are joined by a Newcastle United legend. A man who made more than 300 appearances for Newcastle United in a 10-year spell at the club. Played for some fantastic managers a long way, so it'll be great to hear John talk about those particular managers and even more better players as well, like some Beardsley, Waddle and Gaza, just to name a few. But he's also had a fantastic career as a co-commentator for the last 30 years. He's been with the likes of Nick Lowe's, uh, Matthew Raysbeck, of course, most recently as well. So there's no one better to talk about all things Newcastle United than John Anderson. John, welcome to the Greenwood and Milner Show. Thanks, lads. Pleasure to be here. So, uh, I was going to say, John, you, 40, just over 40 years in terms of your contribution towards Newcastle United, does it just feel like five minutes ago? Well, I didn't realise it was that long. I didn't even <laughs> think about that. Quite honest. Um, yes, it seems seems a long time. I mean, when um, when I first signed at Newcastle, I didn't think, um, I, I didn't really know how long I was going to be there, to be quite honest. I definitely didn't envisage the fact that I'd be still involved doing st stuff 40 years later. Um, you know, it was a, it was a chance um at the chance meeting really um uh, arthur cox rang us up i was asked and he said we'd like you to come up there was myself and another lad called steve doyle came up um and doyle he didn't stay he went to, to huddersfield and played for sunderland as well um i stayed and you know as i say at the time didn't know how long it would be um didn't expect it to be very long but you know, as you say, 40 years later, still here, um, still enjoying watching the football, still enjoy being involved in it. It's great. And like you signed at a very similar time to, to Kevin Keegan, and and the the squad we had was quite an exciting one. Um, what was the kind of ambition at the time that was laid out to you when you were first initially signed for us? Um, well. None really, you know, as I say, um, Arthur, Arthur rang us and said, look, we'd like you to come up. Um, you know, he didn't mention the fact that um, Kevin was going to be signing. Um, but, you know, similar types of signings, you would say, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Kevin arrived in a, in a hail of glory and arrived on an aeroplane. I arrived on a stagecoach bus. You know, so it was, uh, <laughs> similar arrivals, um, but it was it, it was really really weird because, um, as I say, there was Clarky Jeff Clark arrived at the same time. John Craggs came back from Middlesbrough. Um, you know, Terry Terry arrived. David McCreary arrived. So there was there was a few incomings, um, and it was a uh, you know we were away in Madeira actually when when Kevin signed. Um, Arthur didn't Arthur didn't go to Madeira with us. Um, Tommy Kavner was in, in, in charge of the squad. And we all heard the news that Kevin had signed and nobody could believe it. And it, it was surreal because at the time there was a lot of young Geordie boys in the side. You know, you had um, Kenny, Kevin Carr was in goal, Steve Kearney, Lord of Mercy on him, um, Waddler, um, uh, Wes Saunders was there, Peter Haddock, um, you know, the young boys and it was it was really really strange the first few training sessions because nobody really knew how to take kevin we were, we were all young fellas really um kevin was a a global superstar who'd won everything you know was brilliant at liverpool um brave decision to go to germany and took that by storm you know and he was absolutely brilliant and everybody was in awe really um but he was just he was he was just a fabulous fella you know he was down there type of guy um was great with everybody the first season was a little bit strange and obviously then the 80 83 84 promotion season everything just took off but he was he was just uh just a lovely guy you know there were no airs and graces about him um got the best out of everybody um yeah and obviously as we seen when he came back as manager uh, his his man management skills were incredible. When you talk about the 83-84 season, was that your favourite season? And was it also your best season in terms as a player for Newcastle United? Or did you felt that you 
had a better season along in terms of your tenure spell at the club, John? Um, the 83-84 season was, it was one of those seasons you didn't want to end, to be quite honest. I mean, there's some seasons that seem to take forever to from start to finish. Um, it just seemed to drive, you know, because obviously you're not winning games, you're not playing well, things aren't going well. But that 83-84 season just seemed to start and all of a sudden it was over in a flash. Um, you know, we had Kevin, you had Peter, you had Chris Waddle up front, you had Terry Mack in midfield, you had Davey Mack uh, in there with him as well. You know, it was just a it was just a great side to be a part of. You know, it, you just want to play every week. Um, started at, at Leeds on the opening day, red hot August day, got off to a great start, and you know, it was just you wanted to play all the time. Um, and all of a sudden, before you knew it, it was over. Um, and it was, uh, I wish all seasons had been like that, to be perfectly honest. Un unfortunately, they weren't. But yeah, it, it was a fabulous season. You know, it was it was an unreal season. Um, some of the football we played was great. Um, obviously, the goals that the three boys up top scored, scored goals for fun. Um, and it was, it, it was fabulous. It really was. It was... It was great to be a part of and it was it was great to see smiles on people's faces again you know the, the last season um the away game of the season that uh, incredible and, uh, obviously it was their old stadium at leeds road um and the amount of newcastle fans that were there that day was was immense you know it was it, it was surreal there, there was just so many surreal stories that season it was uh every it was black and white it was just incredible kind of like trafalgar square the other week um i actually um want to want to ask you about jack charlton if, if i can uh john because brilliant film come out about him a couple of years ago which coincidentally i watched again the other day and you would have played under him what was what was he like to work for and um did you ever get on the wrong side of him at all? Because I imagine that would be quite scary. Um, Jack was an unbelievable character. Um, you know, he... I don't think he was really cut out for club management, if I'm perfectly honest. I think when he got the Ireland job after he left here, it was tailor-made from, you know, half a dozen games a year. Um, he could do a shoot, he could do his fishing. Um, but he was just... He had his ways about him, um, you know. When he when he first came to Newcastle, we we got out of the old second division by playing football, and um, as I say, with with the three boys up front, um, he came in. He had a look, and he went, "You keep playing like that, you're going to get relegated. Um, we're going to go long. We're going to get a big centre forward in. We're going to play off him." going to get the ball in wide areas we're going to get crosses in the box um and he basically said if anybody doesn't want to do that there's the door no hard feelings out you go you know um but he, he had his ways about him and to be fair you know that first season back in the old the then old first division and we won the opening three games so it, nobody could complain about the way it was going um, but it was never going to work out for Jack because you very rarely seen him on the training ground. Was, you know, he'd turn up two, twice a week, maybe three times a week, or when he did turn up, he'd be late and he'd have a cup of tea in his hand and a fag and he'd still have his free jacket and flat cap <laughs> on. And, um, he was just, it, it's just that way inclined, you know, that's, that's the way that he was. And then um, Jack got the Irish job and I remember first game that he was in charge of was Wales and the lads were all there and they said what's he like and I went well he's something he, that you have seen before he, he's not your typical football manager yeah he's, he's got his ways about him I mean back then the Ireland side so we just trained on the field and we threw a couple of jumpers down and they were goal oh. Oh. No, I think we've lost him briefly. 
we'll just we'll just we'll just carry on anyway. But Jack Charlton, what a character! Yeah, amazing, and that film's ace. Um, just what he did for for Ireland, and uh, it's just a shame. I think, like John said, it was international management just suits um, suits certain managers more than the day to day, and. Um, you know, I, th- I think that was the case with um, that was the case with Jack because he liked um, his off the field stuff uh, as well as the on the field stuff as well, didn't he? Yeah, he certainly did, and I think he would. I, I, I don't know how he would have coped in this day and age. I don't think he would have been able to cope in this day and age in terms of management. But what he did do, I think, what a lot of people would probably want to talk about was his man management because his man management was absolutely superb. And you, you, you know, I think. You can be fantastic on the training pitch. You can be fantastic in terms of coaching players, but if, you, if they don't have that respect, and they don't have you don't have that camaraderie or relationship with a manager, it can be very difficult. Yeah, um, I mean, but you see what he did with the likes of Paul McGraw, which was a very similar relationship, like um, Bobby and Gaza. So Bobby and Gaza had, um, yeah, it, it's. It's, it's it's big personalities you're dealing with, isn't it? and it takes a big personality to uh, to manage a big personality. Yeah, it certainly does. We're just obviously waiting for John to get his uh, uh, his, his connection sorted. So it'll just take a couple of minutes, but um, you know, we're obviously talking about his time when he first arrived at Newcastle as well, playing with the likes of Beardsley, Waddle, Keegan, Gaza, a young Paul Gascoigne. Be interesting to see uh, in John's. Uh, his, his John stories along alongside uh, particularly uh, Paul Gascoigne, but it was Arthur Cox who was the manager when he first arrived, and I was going to ask John this question, or I'll ask him when he comes back about the fact I don't think he really played fullback before he came to Newcastle. He basically said, "Can you play fullback, son?" Uh, yeah, of course I can. <laughs> well, I hope he's got back, yeah, John back now. There's John, fantastic. Uh, John, I was actually just we were just going to ask you um, because I, from what I read. When you first arrived at Newcastle, am I right in saying that you you weren't re- you hadn't really played fullback that often? And they basically said, "Can you play fullback?" Because if, and if you said yeah, you basically said yes. You're basically going to be signing for Newcastle United. It, it, I can't imagine it was that simple in terms of contract negotiations and speaking to the manager uh, Arthur Cox. But can you just tell us a little bit about that? Well, funny enough, before coming to Newcastle, I'd never played fullback at all. I'd always played snapback. <laughs> snap-back. Um, I played. Uh, I can't, went to West Brom as a, an apprentice as a centre back, played all my there as a centre back, went to Preston and played all my football there as a centre back. Um, and when I came up here, um, arrived at St James's and they said we're after a full back. And John Harbs in on the conversation as well. And he says, um, Have you played full back? And I went, Oh, yeah. I said, I played full back before. It's not a problem. And uh, I'd never played full back at all. So, um, and the, the people are probably saying, in years I've never played fullback there. And, and, you know, <laughs> I've never played fullback anyway. So. <laughs> but I mean, that it, it's just why I said it, I do not know. I just said, oh, yeah, I said that I, I can play all across the back. Um, and they went, oh, that's great. Um, you got to remember, it, it, it was different back then as well because there was no social media, there, there was no, you know, um, you couldn't. You check up you couldn't go on and look at players profiles as you can now you can't uh, youtube the, there was none of that stuff so you couldn't go and see um so you basically um took people at their word i suppose and or spoke to people about them um i mean alan kelly was assistant manager at preston at the time um, and he was young gary gary kelly who played up here in goal it was his dad and Coxie had been at Preston as assistant manager when Alan was in goal. So he spoke to him about, about me and Doyle. Um, and whether he asked him if I played fullback or not, I don't know. Um, I haven't got a clue. But when, when Joe said to me, he says, can you play fullback? I said, yeah. And uh, the rest, they say, is history. It just <laughs> it went on from there. I got away with it, I suppose. But um, I always prefer playing at centre back I, and I enjoyed the times when I did play centre back at, at, throughout the career um, you know I was I suppose I got away with a degree playing full back um, but I always preferred playing at centre 
What do you make of the current defence then? Because you've got a bit of a, the, a situation akin to your own with maybe Dan Byrne sort of slotting in at left back, but he's yeah. he's a centre back, isn't he? I mean, I've I've never really seen many six foot seven left backs before, but he seems to be doing the job. And then on the other on the other side, yeah. you've got Kieran Trippier, who's just been just took us to another level. What what and the defence is performing, isn't it? What do you make of it so far? Defensively, we've been brilliant, um, but I, I think you know everybody said the back four has been great. But I think you've got to look at the whole setup of the side, um, and I think especially pre World Cup when you looked at us, intensity that we play played with, um, we pressed from the front. We, I think, when you look at all the stats, the amount of ball we won back in the opposition's final tour to the pitch. In that period was really really high so defensively we never really got asked too many questions because we won the ball back high up the pitch um after the world cup that intensity dropped a little bit uh, and we were a little bit easier to get at because eddie Howe relied on the same 11 12 13 players um and i thought against wolves at the weekend that intensity was back because Isak was chasing their uh, full-backs down, chasing centre-backs down. We were winning the ball back higher up the pitch. Um, so, yeah, from a defensive point of view, it was, it was a team situation. I know the back four got all the credit, but I think you've got to look at the overall picture and look at the picture from, from top to bottom. Um, defensively, we were, as a team, we were, we, we were, we were brilliant. Um, Trippiers, look at full-backs now, are totally different to what they were. You've got, fullbacks have got to be your outlet now. You've got to be, you've got to be proactive and get the forward. You've got to be um, joining in. You've got to be sticking crosses in the box. You've got to be making chances. Um, you know, I think when you, you you look at the stats and see how many crosses the fullbacks put in, you had to do was look at Liverpool. Was it last year with Trippier or with um, Trent Alexander Arnold and Roberts and the amount of chances that they created. You know, and they were fullbacks. Then the chances they created was phenomenal. And Trippy is doing that on the right side for us. I think it's a different scenario um, with Dan Bourne on the on, on the left side. You know, I, he's not a natural modern day fullback. The job he's done has been phenomenal. You know, there's no doubt about it. Um, but I always felt that sooner or later it was always going to catch up with us. You know, because we needed. Everything came down that right side. We needed an outlet. And since the World Cup, team sussed us out a little bit by saying, well, the majority of everything comes on that right side through Trippier, through Almiron, um, through Bruno. The three of them inter intertwine really well. There's not a great deal comes down that left side. Um, and I think it's a, it's a question that has to be answered. As well as he's done, and he's been phenomenal. You know, he's he, he really has. He, he, he's come in and done great, but he's not going to be the answer long term. You know, we're going to have to get a, a naturalised left back in who's comfortable on the ball, who likes to join in, who likes to get forward, who's going to stick crosses in. Um, you know, but you can't take anything away from what the boy has done so far. I, the only criticism I'd have him is I think he should have half a dozen goals this season. You know, when you look at the chances yeah. that he has. I know he scored one, but he's had easier chances that he hasn't hit the target with. And the boy should have, he should have half, half a dozen goals this season. Yeah, that's certainly going to be um, a debate amongst a lot of Newcastle United fans and, go, and how many goals could the whole defence get for Newcastle this season. But they obviously are there to keep the ball out the back of the net. And yeah. John, I think from your, your experience of being involved in Newcastle United, being a player, being in the commentary box, have you ever seen a better defence in terms of maybe the Premier League era? Because they haven't even conceded 20 goals yet this season. This is a, yeah. this is a defence that's the best defence on paper in the Premier League when you look at the stats this season. So how surprising has that been for you watching it week in, week out? It, it, it has been a surprise, you know. But as I said, the, the point that I made earlier, yes, the back four take all the plaudits, but... Um, in recent games you've seen we've given goals away and it's because and i put it down to the fact that it's the intensity hasn't been there 
and we haven't been winning the ball back higher up the pitch. Um, the five changes that he made at the weekend, I thought, felt we had it a bit more intensity about us but you can take nothing away from from um the back four you know they've they've been they've been rocks and they've, they've got a, a fabulous keeper behind them as well you know that that instills an awful lot of confidence in especially in center backs you know if crosses are coming in and you know a goal was coming all the time which pope does you know he comes and collects everything uh it doesn't put doubts in centre backs minds. Is he coming? Is he not coming? Do I need to go and head that? Do I need to go and attack that? Where as soon as Cross has come in, he just comes and collects. You know, he he he, he, he dominates his penalty area, and that instills an awful lot of confidence in your back four. But they've been great. You know, individually and collectively, they've been they've been first class. Um, I always felt prior to Eddie Howe coming in that Shar had a mistake in him. You know, I thought he'd always give you an opportunity. Um, that seems to be enough to be ironed out of his game to a degree. Um, whether uh, long term, you would, he's probably at that age now where you're looking to bring another centre back in. But in Botman, you know, when you think what they spend for him, um, he looks a quality, quality player. You know, he's good on the ball. He's been unlucky. He was lucky in the cup final with the deflection. Um, and then next game there was a deflection as well, you know. But that that's just bad luck. That 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 wasn't poor play, you know. He's trying to trying to block shots and it's taken a deflection and it's it's looped in. On, and you can't put any blame on him whatsoever for that. We've already spoke about the two fullbacks. I mean, Trippier has been Trippier has been immense, you know. Um, he's I suppose if, again, if you're going to be critical, you could look at him for the Liverpool goals and say if he stepped out, both those Liverpool goals would have been offside. But you know. You don't have games like that, you know. You're not going to be put perfect game in, game out. But the season he's had, you know, and it, he just brings so much composure, composure to the back four as well. You know, he's he's a leader. He talks. He shouts. He, he drags people about. Um, I don't think you can give them a, enough credit, really. You know, to especially in a league of this quality, um, when you look at what you're playing against week in week out, to have conceded that least amount of goals is yeah, yeah. It, it's a big, big plot. Yeah, um, if Botman isn't world class already, he certainly will be very soon. What phenomenal talent he is! Um, you, you mentioned the goalkeeper. Um, obviously, he got sent off at the worst possible time. Going into a cup final, if if you were in the defence, how much would that have played on your mind that Carius was was in goal? It wasn't what you were familiar with, and you had a player in the sticks where there's still some mental scars left from his previous final appearance? Yeah, uh, it, it, it's a good question. You know, I think when when you build up a relationship, I mean, that back four has been unchanged for the majority of the season. Well, that back five with that goal. And you do build up relationships, you build up bonds. You you know the habits of... Goalkeeper knows the habits of a centre-backs, full-backs, centre-halves know when keepers come in, as I've already mentioned. Um, and then all of a sudden, a week before a cup final, you, you find out that you're going to have a new keeper in. And it's somebody who hasn't played a, a competitive game for two years. Um, yes, you see him in training day in, day out, but it's, it's a total different scenario to train and to play in a cup final in front of 90,000 people or whatever it may be. Um, you know, a huge game pressure on. Um, and it... it I would, it does play in your mind. It's bound to have played on my mind. But to be fair, to carry us, I thought he came in and he, I he, he was unlucky with the, with the second goal. You know, I think he yeah. was already on his way down when it, it's taken that deflection and it's moved over him. Can't blame him at all for the first goal. It's a good header. You know, no, no goalkeeper's going to stop it. And then he's made two, three, four decent stops, you know, um, throughout the game so you know he, he, i thought he covered himself well i don't think he let himself down um you know um would the european cup final where he dropped the clangers i, I think there's mitigating circumstances there as well you know he took a whack from ramos early on concussed no doubt about it um you know that's you've got to take that into consideration as well and i think it I think it says a lot about his character as well to be fair you know the, the fact that he hadn't played 
a competitive game for that length of time to come a game of that magnitude and perform the way he did i think is full full credit to yeah certainly certainly i guess i would say when there was a bit of discussion between, between uh, amongst our group whether he was at fault for the second goal when you see the replay there's certainly not much more you could have done about that, uh, that no. particular goal but but when you look at newcastle going forwards a man that you would have seen for the last few years with a real close eye on is miguel almiron and he got the winner of course against wolves last sunday john what what do you think the biggest difference is when you look at a miguel almiron two years ago to a Miggy Amron now. I know that obviously the manager has changed and that is, that is a massive difference in better players. But just from him himself and just technically, what do you think the biggest difference is with Miguel Amron? You'd have to say the goals that he scored. You know, if you take his goals out of this season, we wouldn't be where we are, you know. And he had that real purple patch where everything he hit flew in. You know, he didn't score ordinary goals either. They weren't tapping. You know, they, they, they were worldies, you know, um, and he had that real purple patch. It reminds me a little bit of Joe Willock, actually, when Joe Willock came on loan. You know, everything Joe Willock touched flew on the back of the net. You know, he, he couldn't stop scoring. And then, obviously, he signed permanent and he found a goal hard to, a goal's hard to come by. Um, and I think Almiron's had that, that, that period where everything he touched turned to goal um so and i think playing in in front of trippy has helped them as well you know i really do mm. i think there's been a, a, a an understanding there because trippy is such a good talker and knows the game so well and understands the game so well that he drags almiron into into areas that i think prior to trippy coming almiron wouldn't have gone into you know, um, the thing with Miggy Almiron is it, it's all about not saying he hasn't got quality and hasn't got ability, but it's all about his work rate and his desire. And he runs around and a lost cause. And when he loses, he chases, he gets back. But I think Trippy has quieted him down a little bit as well. You don't need to do that all the time. You need to conserve your energy and you'll get so much more out of your game by, by doing that. And I, I think He's had a great season, you know, there's no doubt about it. He was rested at the weekend. Got a little bit of luck with the Wolves goal. I didn't see it first. I didn't think of it. I thought he, he just bent it straight in, but it's taken a, a deflection. Um, but look at he's he's been excellent. Um, probably needed a breather. Whether he started Forest on Friday, I'm not, I'm not sure. You know, I think it'd be on. I know he came on and scored a goal, but I think it'd be unfair on the boys who were given the opportunity by Eddie Howe, because as I say, I think that they came in and they gave us a little bit of a, a different dimension, a little bit of a freshness. Um, I think he might have to settle for a place on the bench again, but if he can keep coming off the bench and scoring goals, I don't think he'll have too many complaints, but, but he's had a fabulous season. As a lot have, look, you know, I think you can't be critical of, of anybody. You know, I think that the job that they've done this season you've got to a cup final chasing the champions league spot if you had said that at the start of august people would have you know been more than happy, absolutely more than happy but you know the problem is now that those stand, the standards are set you know the standards are there we've got to meet them now on a regular basis yeah i think that's a good point about what you say about the standards because on the other wing, you've got a player of Alan St. Maximum's quality. Consistency is is what he's he's lacking. We've 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 all met him, uh, or, um, but your meeting with him in the BBC Newcastle studio is is more legendary than when me and Johnny met him. Um, yeah. What do you make of his his character, and is he a player that? will still be involved in the coming seasons when, like you say, the standards are lifting and the the ambition is lifting and the expectation is, is lifting? Mm -hmm. oh, I think that's a real interesting question. I think there's a big question mark over that. I, when you look at, look at the thing with St. Maximum is he gets people off the seats. He gets people on the edge of the seat because he's a maverick. He does the unexpected. He's capable 
of winning your football match on his own. He's capable of unbelievable ability on the ball. Uh, score cracking goals as we've seen at Wolves. You know, he can turn defenders inside out. But then he's got, on the other hand, he can drive you up the wall because he can't, he doesn't do the simple things well enough. You know, he'll get away from five yards, but then the next minute he'll, he'll go past three or four, four defenders. Um, I think when you look at Eddie Howe's sides, and I, I think I think this is relevant as well, what he said about Isak not being fit playing 90 minutes. And he said he'd be fit enough to play 90 minutes in the teams, but not the way I want my players to play. You know, Isak ran himself into the ground at the weekend, got 70 minutes, but his performance was unbelievable. Now, if he yeah. did that week in, week out, and only got 70 minutes, everybody would be delighted. St. Maxman doesn't do that. He doesn't do the dirty stuff. And look, I'm not blaming him because it's not his fault. It's it's alien to him. You know, he's, he, he's been brought up where people get the ball to him and he goes and does his stuff. And if he loses it, somebody else gets it back and gives it back to him again. Um, and I think Eddie Hell wants everybody. It doesn't matter of what ability you are. Everybody's got to do their job. Everybody's got to work for the team. Um, I think, and I think people agree with this or not, uh, but it's my opinion that you look at Eddie, Eddie Howe's sides, they're all very structured. By that I mean everybody knows their job, the areas of the pitch they play in, what's expected of them when they're on the ball, what's expected of them when they're not on the ball. When you lose the ball, you get back into an area, you fill a hole, you chase, you close people down. Now, it's not about flying into tackles. It's just about running that extra 10 yards to get back to fill holes that so the opposition can't go and play in. Does St. Maximum do that enough? Probably not. Do I see him long term as an Eddie Howe player? Probably not. And people will have disagree or agree with that, whichever way they look at it. I, I think Eddie Howe likes players who are disciplined, you know. Isak's come in, he's bought into the concept because of, we've seen that at the weekend. Um, Botman's come in, he's bought into the concept. Bruno's come in, he's bought into the concept. You know, the, the work rate and desire is all to be there. And then you go and play when you have the ball. But when you haven't got the ball, it's all about getting it back and getting it back quickly. And I just think St. Maximum's trying to do it. You know, he, he is trying to do it he's trying to get into areas but as i say it's alien to him it's foreign to him it's not his fault um do i see him long term i think if the right offer came in if they were offered silly money i think eddie hell would see, see consider yeah well it'll be certainly an interesting conversation in the summer in regards to newcastle's transfer targets but a man that came in in the january of last year who let's be honest i don't think a lot of newcastle fans or People um, who who watch Newcastle on a regular basis, unless they watch French football on a regular basis, as Bruno Guimaraes, you just you touched on them before, John. A lot of people, like I sit in the gallery for my season ticket, and I always remember this one gentleman who was about three or four, uh, three or four seats to the right of me, and he went, "It looks like he's got wing mirrors. He just knows where the extra bit of space is, or like where the extra man is to make that particular pass." Have you ever seen anything like him at Newcastle? Now, I know it's a really difficult question in the sense that he's only been here just over a year but it's just that amount of quality he has in that center of the park for newcastle what he's very good at is finding space you know his awareness of people around him and his awareness of opposition players around them is you know you can't he sees it he sees the space so when he when he gets the ball he's always got time you know, he makes time for himself because of the areas of the pitch he, he finds himself in. Quality players do that. You know, Gascoigne did it. Beardsley did it. Um, you know, you look at your top midfield players, the one thing they've all got in common is the amount of time they've got on the ball because they find space for themselves. Um, now, it's one thing finding the space. It's another thing having the ability to then go and use it. Um, and... 
we've got workmen like midfield players you know joe linton big strong physical um he's got a presence in there sean longstaff works his socks off willock great athlete but bruno he unlocks it you know he's he's the key he's the one who see- i'm not saying the others don't see the pass um it's one thing seen it's another thing being able to do it and bruno can do it you know he sees it and he can make it happen as well he sees that little pass um and he plays it and the way he's adapted so quickly is full credit to him you know players come from abroad um they need time to adapt to the physicality of the premier league to the pace of the premier league but he hit the ground running straight away we've been very fortunate actually with the players who've come in because they've all adapted really, really quickly but for a midfield player to do it is you know because it's all going on in there in that central midfield area the pace of the game it, it all goes on around you it all happens so quickly and he's adapted to it so well um he's just he's just a top top player you know and uh he's bought into everything he, he shows his emotions you know he's an emotional type of guy um crowd have taken to him he's just as i say he's just a top player yeah there's nothing uh newcastle fans love more than players showing their emotion because it um just enhances that connection doesn't it but and i think you're the perfect person to settle an argument between uh myself and my esteemed co-host jonathan um the other week we were doing um, our ultimate Premier League Newcastle United 11s and we, we got into, some would say a heated argument, some would say a debate about um, the midfield pairing because we both did 4-4-2 to keep it sort of level. Right. Um, I went, f- uh, my midfield pairing was Rob Lee and Bruno. And and uh, the thicker, I mean Johnny, um, went for Kabay and Teote. Um who would who would your sort of um, Premier League Newcastle United pick be for a centre midfield partnership and and whose is better? I'm going to split it. I'm going to go with Kabay and Bruno. Really? Yeah. No, Rob Lee. Rob Lee's great player. I just Kabay scored goals as well, um, and I. I just think technically he was better on the ball than Rob Lee. Um, Rob Lee, great energy, box to box. Yeah, I can see that. I think it, I think it's a real, it's a real difficult one. But I I like Kabay when he was here, and I know the way it ended and one thing and another. But I thought he was a top player. Um, Tiote, Lord of mercy on him, was wore his heart on his sleeve. I thought I honestly thought when Tiote came here first, he was brilliant what he did he won it he gave it he won it he gave it and then he got all the plaudits and everything else. and then he tried to start to play and by that i mean he thought he was a midfield give me the ball I'll go and play and it wasn't his game and i think it took away from him. he stopped doing the things he was really good at which got him a reputation you know he went and he won it and he gave it nice and simple um then he was trying to knock 40 yarders and, and one thing and another. But no, it'd be Kabay and uh, uh, Bruno for me. They are, that's, that's the argument for you, doesn't it? You know, it does. Um, <laughs> I'm saying, I'm it, do, it, does for, it does for one of us. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, to be honest with you, John, the way you described it wasn't a million miles the way I described it, I have to be honest. I'm oh, why <laughs> your neck in. <laughs> 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 but we'll, we'll, we'll move on very, very quickly before we have any more arguments. Um, I have to talk about the manager because obviously you would have played under a lot of managers at Newcastle. I've mentioned later, obviously Jack Chart and Arthur Cox, obviously Kevin Keegan, obviously player then manager. How does Eddie Howe compare to the managers that you've seen at Newcastle over the last 30, 40 years? And not, not to put too much pressure on him, can, do you think he can be the man that can break this, this trophy hoodoo, if you like? I don't think you can give him um, enough credit. I think the situation that he walked into was really, really difficult. You know, when you looked at where we were, um, confidence was low, um, players weren't playing well. You could see that players weren't enjoying the football. Uh, and 
it was a difficult thing for him to to lift everybody's spirits and to get them that confidence back and i think how quick he did it was you know was remarkable i think the job that he did and the job that he's doing can never be underestimated you know to, to finish where we finished from the position we were in when he came in was you know nobody would have seen that you know nobody would if, if we had to finish fourth bottom everybody would have said oh he's done a great job you know that's phenomenal yeah. just to keep us up but to to finish where we did um you know i don't think you can you can give him enough plaudits and enough credit uh, but then to carry it on this season you know to start the season that we've done um i think they've been really shrewd in the in the transfer market you know i think the the, the boys that they brought in as i've already mentioned hit the ground run and settled in straight away um they bedded in he built the system it's all a desire work rate everybody knows what they've got to do um and you just can't give the guy enough credit you know to, to get us to a cup final um was phenomenal you know it was great it was atmosphere everything about the day was great the, the only disappointing thing about it was the was the result now i think that would have given him a greater desire you know i'm not saying he hasn't got that desire anyway but i think when he's seen what happened at wembley and the mass hordes of black and whites at wembley he would have said i want a bit more of that you know i want to do this again i want to be back here i want to win it i want to you know i want to be a manager who wins trophies um and then all of a sudden the adulation takes off um but in saying that in doing what he's doing and what he's done brings other pressures because then he's got to keep doing it you know that that pressure that pressure doesn't go away if anything the pressure now is greater than it was when he took over 12 months ago because you know people went oh well if we go down it's not his fault you know because of the situation that he took over you know you can't blame him for that but then he did what he did and he's done what he's done this season the pressure just mounts and mounts because people say oh, well we finished when we finished this season you've got to finish higher again next season and if you finish top four this season you know you've got to finish tour next season and <laughs> I, I know that's you know people will look at that and be done no 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 that's not right but you, you understand the point that i'm making you know success yeah. brings added pressures you know and it brings probably more pressure um so but you can't underestimate the job that he's done no matter where we finish this season whether we finish fourth fifth sixth seventh whatever the job that he's done this season is is phenomenal but it's only going to get greater again next season you know and he seems to be he seems as if he's bought into that and he realizes that and he knows it and he knows the pressures that that comes with that um you know and he's he's he seems to be well up for it as well you know so uh but at this moment in time you can't give him you, you can't give him any the highest plaudits in the world you know if if, if you were given a manager of the year and you he, he, in my opinion he'd win it you know he, he definitely would win it for the job that he's done and the way that he's torn a football club around not just on the pitch but you know destruction everything else about the place and how he's got supporters back on side as well you know this this club was a total mess you know nobody nobody wanted to go to games i mean we were going to games doing games and you were waking up in the morning and go i don't want to do this you know i don't want to go you know exactly what it's going to be like there's nothing to look forward to we'll go we'll sit behind the ball we'll see if we can nick a goal won't try and win games um so the job that he's done has been been phenomenal and the way he's got the supporters to to interact in it as well as you know it's been first class and, and i know it's easy to say that oh well supporters are going to be like that you're winning games and things are going well of course they are but you have to get there in the first place you know you need to have a team that's that's doing that and even when you lose games now you know players aren't leaving anything on the pitch you know they're going and they're giving that they're all and if you get beat well 
supporters aren't having to complain because they know that the players haven't left anything on the football pitch. They've given it their all. They've tried to win games. Um, and supporters, that's all he asks. You know, that players go and give it everything that they've got. And if it's not good enough on the day, well, so be it. We'll, we'll go again next week. I think with what you were saying before about Jack Charlton not suiting club management, suiting international management, I think it's the polar opposite with Eddie Howe. Like the day-to-day -day stuff is is so sort of crucial Absolutely. to him. And yeah. but it, but in a couple of years time if he's still at Newcastle and England you know do what England normally do and that job is available would that worry you that he may turn to to the not in the, next, no, not in the next couple of years. I still think he's too young for that England job. I think when you hear him speak and you he wants to be on the train pitch you know you're right he is the total polar opposite to jack jack didn't want to be on the training pitch you know he didn't want the involvement of every day some managers do some managers don't um but it was uh the way that he's you hear him speak and he, he enjoys working with players he enjoys being on the on the training ground with with players uh he enjoys improving players so you know so if he keeps going the way that he's going somewhere along the line he probably will be offered that england job but i still think he's too young a manager at this moment in time to mm -hmm. to go into that you know that because he wants the everyday involvement because he wants to be on the training pitch day in day out um i wouldn't have any concerns about it for a while um and when i say a while i'm you know i'm looking quite a few years down the line um i think it's going to be really interesting because, as I said, I think the pressure that is on them now to keep doing what he's doing, you know, it's it's only going to get greater as well because the more success that you you get, the greater that pressure on managers become because you've got to keep producing, you know, and you've got to keep doing it season in season now. And we know that if you're successful one season and it doesn't happen then the next season, you know. Uh, it can be a volatile business being a manager, you know, because owners of football clubs aren't, you know, they're not slow in making changes. So, but look at the job that he's doing at this moment in time is phenomenal. Do I see him as an England manager in the future? Probably, but not in the foreseeable future. I never thought I'd be saying this um, within the last couple of years in Newcastle, but we are in a race to get into the Champions League. and. Obviously, when you hear, see the results just from the other day, even talking about Brighton and Brentford potentially being in this race, I don't think they will be toward the latter end. But you, you never know. While, the, while they're only a couple of points behind Newcastle, you have to consider them. Of course, you're going to consider Tottenham. I'm almost going to throw Manchester United in this sort of race if they fall off the cliff a little bit. And then, of course, you've got Liverpool and Chelsea. You're kind of just sniffing around. Liverpool, definitely. Chelsea, will. I'm sure people will, will agree or disagree with that. But... Where do, you, where do you see Newcastle in this Champions League race, John? Because the City just Premier League every week for them. You know, they haven't got, I know Liverpool out the Champions League, Tottenham out the Champions League, but it's it's kind of a bit down at the minute in terms of Tottenham and Liverpool in particular. When Newcastle, everything's so positive. We're with, with a new kid on the, on the block, if you like, in regards to this race. Do you think that if we can get a little bit of a purple patch like we did between, say, uh, middle of September to November, then it is kind of almost going to be very, very difficult for Newcastle not to be in the top four. Or do you think it's a bit too much for the squad? No, I don't think it's too much for the squad at all. I think I'm not too sure anybody wants, you know, you look at the way the results went to the weekend. Obviously, we won, but nobody behind us won games or in and around us won games. And you look at any time, does anybody actually want to grab one of these Champions League places? Does anybody want, you know, it's there to be grabbed. Do you want it? Now, is that down to a, a lack of quality in certain sides in this Premier League this season? I mean, you mentioned Brighton there. I think Brighton are a good side. I think we're a good football side. I think it'd be too much for Brentford. I think Brighton will keep going. Um, Tottenham, hot and cold. You just don't know what's going on with the manager. Um, Liverpool, you just, I mean, they stick seven past Manchester United and they go to Bournemouth and get beaten. You know, that that's just total inconsistency there. Chelsea, um, 
I would still be waiting. I think Chelsea could put a run together. You know, all of a sudden they've been a couple. The, the confidence seems to be growing a little bit. If they were to put a run together, um, you know, we go down on the last day of the season. We've got Arsenal here. We've got um, Spurs here. We've got Brighton to come here as well. You, you know, so there's, there's some big, big games coming along. Um, we needed to get back to in ways. You know, we were, it's all right people saying, oh, well, we weren't losing things, but we've been better off losing a couple of games and winning a couple of games from a points perspective. You know, it would have gave us more points. We'd have been higher up the league. So uh, I thought against Wolves the weekend, it was huge for us to win. You know, it was really important. Um, and I think it's important for us to win at the weekend as well, going into an international break, because it gives you that little bit of a lift. Give a little bit confidence comes back and you can go away to the hot weather training camp and you know on the back of that um so the yeah it, it's an interesting one it really is you know you, you just wonder i think it's going to come down to the fact who wants it the most you know who who really wants it the most um because i think next season i don't think chelsea will be as poor i don't think liverpool will be as poor you just don't know what's going to happen at Spurs, but you never know what's going to happen from, at Spurs from, from season to season. Will Conte be there? Will he not? Will Harry Kane be there? Will he not? Um, I think there's a massive, massive opportunity for us. You know? And if that opportunity is there, you've got to grab it. You know, you've got to take it. You, you, it's not every season that you get the opportunity to qualify for a Champions League. So if it's there, yeah. Uh, and I do think it's there because, as I said, I don't think... I don't think anybody wants to grab that those Champions League spots. The, you know, it, everybody keeps dropping points, and you, you, you look at it and you go, "How has that happened? How have they not won?" How, you know, Liverpool going to going going to um, Bournemouth, and you just said, "Yeah, the, that seven goal, you know, they'll be on a high. They'll really fancy this." And then they go, and, and you just don't know what's going on. Yeah. I mean, hopefully this summer we buy more than Vernon and Anita to uh, balance a, a European campaign. But um, I want to speak about your commentary, your co-commentary uh, with Razor, because um, I would describe you as the perfect co-commentator for Newcastle United because you are all of us when you're watching that game, whether it's a little quip like dodgy keeper when we're playing Everton or the the now infamous just put it in the net when Jacob Murphy goes in one on one. Um, do you almost forget you're on comms when you're watching yeah. the game? Absolutely, because <laughs> it, yeah. it seems like that, but in a good yeah. way. Ha, absolutely, yeah. Um, I I think you just you get wrapped up in it. You know, at the end of the day, you, you're a football fan. You know, you're a Newcastle United fan, um, and you're lucky enough. To get the games and, and do the commentaries but you do get you do forget um i forgot it a couple of times at wembley when i got reprimanded for saying certain things but um nobody seems no one remembers them thank god but uh you know yeah i mean the, the the jacob morphy thing where that came from i haven't got a clue you know it just and i i never even thought about it didn't give it any thought whatsoever to um, we were on our way back, and, and Razor went, Have you seen this? And I went, Seen what? And he went, Listen. And I, I didn't even know I'd said it. I didn't realize that's what I'd said. Um, and look, if I say dodgy keeper, I think he's a dodgy keeper. And, you know, that's, <laughs> he is. But, yeah, I, yeah, he is. Um, but it's, <laughs> you know, you, you do get carried, carried away. You, you try to stay calm. But there's certain situations where it just it just boils over. I'm not apologising. No, no, because it is. It, 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 it's, it's that's what I mean. That's what makes it so perfect. Because it is. It's just fantastic and everything. I like. I think as a fan base, when when the clips of the goals get released and it's it's yourself and Razor on comms, like it's it's the yin and the yang. Just you dovetail so well off each other and. It's like people wait for for your commentary to come over the goals instead of listening to like like the world feed or or Sky or whatever because it's just so much better and and like it has their moments that just people remember. 
But yeah, that Jacob Murphy one was just because you were all of us in that moment. Oh dear. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, just finally, John, I've got two last quick questions for you. The, the first one is about commentary. Were you ever given any advice about code commentary and do you still use that to this day? And finally, you've been involved with Newcastle, as I mentioned, for over 40 years. What has been the standout moments since you've been at Newcastle? Has there been one particular moment where you just go, wow, what, what, what a moment, and I'm so glad that I was there? Um, the commentary one, no. No, I just fell into it. I was still I was still under contract when I fell into it and got asked to do a game. Um, and it just seemed to come about. And then when I finished, they they, they asked us to do it. Um, and I, I think the the thing for me was I was lucky that I worked with good people. You know, Ian Dennis, who's now at Radio Fire, uh, Losey was phenomenal. Um, you know, and Razor was Losey's. Uh, Losey had Razor under his wing, so uh, he, he's learned from the best. You know, and I was I, I was fortunate enough to to work with people who were exceptional at the job, um, you know, so you just learn from these people. Um, and I always, I always found that you, you try to be honest, you know, you, you can't, when you are doing a game on radio and people are listening to it, you can't try and gloss over if it's poor, it's poor. You can't try and say, oh, well, this is, you know, if it's not, you've got to you've got to be honest with people because, um, and some people don't like it. You know, if we, if we're poor and you say that we're poor, some people say, "Oh, well, it's too critical." But you know, you've got to say what you see. Um, unfortunately, this season there hasn't been too much of that. You know, there's been yes, there's been moments, of course, there have. Um, as far as I think the the game that always comes back to me, you know. We had two cup finals. You had a semi final against Chelsea, but that Champions League game at Feyenoord, you know, yeah, I think you had to be there to to really because we we'd lost the opening couple of games in that Champions League campaign as well, and to do what we did in those closing moments to get through was you know I think it, it was one of those I was I I was there. You know, and you speak to people who weren't there, but they were there. You know, oh, I was there that night when uh, when that happened. You know, so um, and the other one was that Chelsea Cup final or Cup Cup semi final when Poyet. You could see it. You could see it building up down that left side, and he stuck the cross in, and you you just knew it had goal written all over it, and um, you thought, oh no, um, but look at. There were, there were so many good things, you know. There's been quite a few bad things as well, you know. Some of it's been absolute rubbish, and from <laughs> from a playing point of view as well, as well as a commentating point of view, you know. Obviously, uh, getting getting relegated, and when Sir John was trying to take the club over from the McKees and one thing and another, it was a it was a hostile environment to play in, you know. And I've seen players freeze, you know, just didn't want didn't want there because the atmosphere was was really toxic but there was there's been more good times than bad times you know and i'm fortunate enough to have been involved in um especially the last 30 years or so you know since since i finished playing and since doing the commentary there's been there's been more good than bad i mean obviously there was two cup finals semi-final those champions leagues um you know, uh, it was watching, even though it was against us, watching the yeah, Drogba do what he did to us in Marseille. Um, mm. You know, his performance that night will, was phenomenal. Uh, I still maintain, though, if, if Woodgate had been fit, because Woodgate didn't give him a kick in the game here. Um, yeah. And I think if Woodgate had been fit, it might have been a different game because for me, Woodgate was. He, he, he's if we could have kept him fit um he was a phenomenal player he's probably he's the best sample seen at newcastle without a doubt 
Well, he was, but he was, he was, he was in our uh, Premier League elevens as well. So that's one thing we do agree on. Yeah, uh, we did. <laughs> well, I'm glad we agreed on something there. John, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you about all things Newcastle United. Again, there's someone that's been involved with the club in so many different uh, capacities for the last 40 years. You know, you're certainly the right man to talk all things Newcastle. So we generally do appreciate your time talking all things uh, Newcastle United, especially when everything seems to be going pretty well at the minute. Cheers, boys. Thanks, Mike. Enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. It was good. Sam, where can everybody listen? No problem at all. Sam, where can everybody listen to this podcast? So, links are all in the description. New episode out every Tuesday. If you listen on iTunes, smash the subscribe button and the five-star review. And uh, if you're watching it on YouTube, then uh, hit the like button as well. So from myself, Jonathan Green, and my host, Sam Muller, and today's guest, the Newcastle United legend, John Anderson. We'll see you all very soon.